enough of that business. Let's talk about section 4.5. Uh, in section 4.5, we have this concept of at least one versus none versus more than, less than, things like that. But you need to know these concepts because we're going to be dealing with that in the next sections. What I need to get across to you in section 4.5 is that sometimes it's easier to deal with the complement of a set than it is the set itself, a lot of times. And we're going to do a couple examples to illustrate that. But first I need to give you the definition of what it means to, for the statement, at least one. So if I say, <coughs> at least one, what does that mean to you? At least one. Say that again. One or more. Okay, so one would satisfy that or two would satisfy that, or three would satisfy that, or four would satisfy that, or more than that would satisfy that, right? What's the only thing that will not satisfy at least one? Good. So we're going to say two things about at least one. Firstly, at least one means one or more. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, forever. Does that make sense to you? The complement, therefore, is the complement of at least one is, what would you say the only thing that doesn't satisfy at least one is? Zero. zero. The complement of at least one is none. Zero. That's what we're going to say about this. So at least one means one or more. Therefore, the complement of at least one or the complement of one or more is none. You have none of that. So the complement of at least one is none. If you don't have at least one of something, you have none. If you don't have at least one dollar, or at least some amount of money in your pocket, then you have no money in your pocket. That's the compliment there. What's nice about this is this leads us to this, this definition mathematically for at least one. If you're talking about the probability, oops. If you're talking about the probability of at least one, Hey, do you remember a long time ago when we talked about complements and probability of complements? We said that if we have complements A and complement of A, the probability of A is 1 minus the probability of the complement of A. Do you remember that? Yes, no? It was kind of a basic idea, really. You, you're either in the event or you're in the complement. You cannot be anywhere else besides the event or the complement of the event. So we understood that the probability of an event plus the probability of its complement equaled 1. There's a 100% probability you will be in one of these two things. Agreed? Yeah. That probability is 1. If I subtract this from both sides, I get the probability of an event equals 1 minus the probability of the complement. That's the idea. Well, if my event is at least 1, we're talking about at least 1 of something, what was the complement of at least one again? One. At least none. 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 Zero. Or the probability of having none of whatever you're talking about. The probability of at least one is one minus the probability of none. I need to raise your hand if you understand that, that concept. You're either going to be at least one or none. You understand that? You're either going to have one or more of something or none of something. There's only two situations there. You can't have at least one dollar and have no dollars. You can't have no dollars and have at least one dollar. It's, it's either vice versa, or sorry, it's one or the other. So if we're either here or here, then this equals one minus that probability. It, it is this situation. This is the complement of that situation. Now, why, why do we do that? Well, we, we do this because sometimes finding this probability is very, very hard. And sometimes finding this probability is a whole lot easier. Because this probability, finding at least one of something, that would be like saying the probability of having one, or two, or three, or four, or, 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 and 
adding all those probabilities up, including the possibility that they overlap. Does that make sense to you? That's a whole lot of work. That's a lot of work. We don't want to do that. So what if, instead of conquering this directly, kind of take the back door? We just do this one and subtract it from one. Doesn't that seem a whole lot easier? The probability of none is pretty easy. There's only one situation that that can take place. You have none of the item you're talking about. Do you see the difference there? So this is definitely an or probability. One, or two, or three, or four. That's addition rule over and over and over and over and over again for how many things you're talking about. This one's not. This is a very easy probability. It's just one situation where you have none of the, the uh, outcome that you're talking about. Would you like to see an example? This is all very vague right now. Yes. I'm glad. Oh, you almost had it. Almost. It was like right there. Dropped it. For example, let's say, for a simple example, I'm going to give you a coin and you're going to flip it three times. What I want to know Bless you. Thank you. You're welcome. Flip coin three times. What's the probability of getting at least one head? There's that, that term, at least, again. What's the probability of getting at least one head in this case? So we're looking for the probability of at least one head. <coughs> I want you to notice this is different than any probability we've dealt with yet. Okay? Re really it is. Because when you think about this, what's going to satisfy at least one head when you have flipping a coin three times? Would flipping a coin and getting heads, 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 would that do it? Yes. That's at least one. How about head, tail, tail? That's at least one. How about head, tail, head? At least one. So as long as there's one or more heads in there, that satisfies this. That's a whole lot of work, right? That, that's thinking about a whole lot of situations that could happen. We can do this one of two ways. The first way... <laughs> The first way, if you did this according to the sample space, you could do this problem. So let's talk about the sample space of flipping a coin three times, okay? Remember what a sample space is? Yeah. Tell me what a sample space is then. What's a sample space? Yeah. Hmm? Is it all your possible outcomes. All your possible outcomes. So everything that could possibly happen for our procedure, which is flipping a coin how many times? So we can't just get head, because we would have head and then two other situations come out of that. So, first thing that happened, you could get head, head, head. Tell me the next thing that would happen. That could happen. Perfect. And we can cycle through that. We've done this before. That's all four situations starting with the head. We could start with the tail as well. Tail, tail, tail. All the situations starting with. Oh no, I messed up. Now. I had this one twice, I'm sorry. I should have had tail, head, head. That's all four situations starting with our heads and starting with our tails. So, would you agree that this is all eight possible situations you could possibly get out of flipping a coin three times? Agreed? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Now, can you tell me how many of these things satisfy? at least one head. Let's see. Does this have at least one head? Mm -hmm. There's one. How about this one? Yeah. That has two heads. That's at least one. How about this one? Yeah. This one? Yeah. This one? Yeah. one, one ten. This one? Yeah. Six. This one? Yeah. Seven. This one? Yeah. No. So how many ways satisfy at least one head? Seven, seven ways. Do you all count the seven ways? Yeah. Seven of those have a, at least one H. One or more. So we have seven out of the total possible how many? Our probability of getting at least one head is seven eighths. So if someone came to you and said, flip a coin three times, I'll bet you you can't get at least one head. You'd be like, yeah, I probably can. 
Seven eighths chance that, that that's going to happen. That's a good bet for you. True. Good bet. Now, is there a different way to do it? The answer is yeah. There's a different way to do it because this way is pretty taxing. I'm going to show you this in a, in a little while. This takes a long time to actually think about and do in some situations. What if there's a different way? The different way is instead of thinking about this directly, like what's the probability of at least one head, which when you really think about it, that's the probability of all three heads or two heads or one head in our situation. What if we thought about it like the probability of at least one as one minus the probability of none. But we have to think about what does the probability of no heads entail? If you have no heads, what are you getting? All ten. Okay, that would be a tail, and a tail, and a tail. Does that make sense to you? The only way you're going to get none of something is if you have the alternate possibility all three times. So for instance, if you're flipping a coin three times and you're looking for at least one head, the complement of at least one was, what was the complement of at least one again? No heads. No heads means all tails, true? That means you get a tail, and then what happens next? And then what happens next? That's the only possible case. Do you, are you recognizing that? So if you notice the words I use, tail, and then a tail, and then a tail, didn't you just do homework on that? So probability of none in our case, or I can say it this way, at least one head would be no heads. would be the same thing as the probability of getting all tails. Move up here. Well, if we have the probability of all tails, what all of something means, if you had every single flip of the coin was a tail, that's a tail and a tail and a tail. You see the, the multiplication rule coming out at you? This is the probability of all tails means tail and tail and tail. Notice how you're dealing with successive events here. You're flipping a coin, then you're taking it again, and you're flipping it again, then you take it back, and you're flipping it again. See so yeah, how we're doing three different things there? So, firstly, the question is, are these things independent? Is flipping a coin independent or dependent? What do you think? Independent. Does flipping the first tail affect the outcome of the second? No. Not one bit. Okay, I'm going to recap before we go any further. Firstly, can you do probability of at least one directly? The answer is, of course you can. You just have to draw the sample space and kind of think about it. Or do the probability of 1 plus the, prob the or probability of 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 with however many flips of the coin that you have. You with me on that? You could do that. That's, that's directly. Or you could do it using the complement. The complement of at least 1 is none. If we just find out the probability of getting no heads in this case, or no heads means all tails, right? Yes? There's no heads, tails, and bananas. That doesn't really make sense. So it's either you get heads or tails. So you're either, your no heads means